the mother wound. What in God's name is the mother wound? And do you even have a mother wound? What does it look like? What are the signs if you have a mother wound? In this week's episode, my guest, Elizabeth Kipp and I dive deep into what this looks like. We share how we both have experienced a mother wound, how the mother wound contributes or is related to trauma, and how from having the mother wound, one can develop perfectionistic tendencies, people-pleasing tendencies, and being a high overachiever. So you will not want to miss this episode of Elizabeth and I diving deep into what the mother wound is. Welcome to the Masks Off for People Pleasers and Perfectionist podcast. I am Kim Gross, your host, and it is my mission to help you unmask from people pleasing and perfectionistic behaviors so that you can finally have the confidence to live the life that you truly desire. Let's tune in to this week's episode. I'm going to start as I always do by reading a quote. And the quote was offered by Elizabeth. And it is, by embracing your mother wound as your yoga, you transform what has been a hindrance in your life into a teacher of the heart. And that's by Philip Moffat. Welcome to the show and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you so much, Kim. It's it's my pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm a stress management and historical trauma specialist, trauma trained and yoga informed addiction recovery coach and ancestral clearing practitioner. Also with best-selling author of The Way Through Chronic Pain, Tools to Reclaim Your Healing Power. I love it. I love all of it because I can relate to so much, but let's just jump in and we want to talk about the mother wound. I think for the listeners who aren't really fully aware of what that even means, the mother wound, what does it mean and what does it look like if someone has that? We'll start there. Great. That's a big question. <laughs> it is. I'll try and I'll try and thumbnail that. I'll give you the energy of it first. Okay. If you're in a relationship and you're holding on for dear life to that relationship, that's a reflection of a mother wound. Now it could be a father wound, but it's most likely a mother wound when we're holding on for dear life. There's a difference between I'm holding on for dear life and holding your hand out and letting that person be who they are and give what they have and be happy with whatever's showing up there. The mother wound is also, I think it's also a boundary issue. I think it shows up as we don't really understand what a healthy boundary looks like. And I can give you some examples of that, but mostly... I had, I carried the energy of this and I really never understood how to name it or that it really was the thing it was until I read a book called Mother Hunger. I don't remember who wrote it, but Mother Hunger is the book, very powerful book. And she talked about the way she was talking. I realized what had happened with me and my own mom was my mom was bipolar and she had pain and she medicated all of it with alcohol. So she was unpredictable. And I never knew when she was going to be scary and punishing, but it would happen every day at some point. I just didn't know when or why. So it was very inconsistent. And so anyway, so there were a couple of energies that I created uh, that I developed around that. One was hypervigilance, so looking around mm-hmm. all the time, what's going to happen kind of thing. But the other thing, which I didn't really understand until I read Mother Hunger, was the energy of I'll do whatever I need to do in order to get you to love me. Mm-hmm. And it's and it so there's that's the that's the mantra happening, but the energy of it is this. 
I'm grasping. So there's this chasing and seeking and and never giving up kind of energy that that goes with that. And it's a real, it's got this energy of desperation. Mm-hmm. And if I'm busy, people pleasing, busy doing that, then what's interesting about that is there's something inside of me I'm not pleased with. If I'm always reaching out there, yes, I'm disconnected from myself. And so a hundred percent. I love how you talked about all of this from the angle of energy, because I really felt it when you described it. And I think that will allow for the listeners to really tap in to their own inner world to recognize, wow, do I feel this? Do I have this energy? So then maybe I do have a mother wound. And Mm -hmm. what I really connected with, I connected with all of it, but I'm going to highlight that hypervigilance of the eggshell environment, being hypervigilant, waiting for the bomb to drop, waiting for the other shoe to drop. When was my mother going to explode? When would she rage when versus when she was being really loving and in quote unquote, loving and endearing or sweet and giving. And so you do a ton of work, you're a trauma informed specialist doesn't this, isn't this trauma? I feel like this is trauma, right? Because if your nervous system is constantly dysregulated as a child and you're not sure if you are going to be able to be attached in a healthy way Mm. and have that attachment in a healthy way, your nervous system, I, I know I'm just speaking from my own experience. My nervous system was dysregulated all the time. And that's why I did the grasping. That's why I did the pleasing of my mom, because I didn't want her to withdraw her love. I didn't want her to rage at me, leave the house because as a little girl, as a seven-year-old, I didn't know if she was ever coming back. There was really times when I feared That when she drove off in her car, was she coming back? What did I do something so bad that I made her leave forever? So there's that it's all trauma, is it not? Yes. And let's get very clear about what trauma is, which Dr. Gopal Mate just lays out so beautifully and so simply. It's not trauma is not what happens to you. It's what happens inside of you because of what happens to you. And it's because we're alone with that hurt. Mm-hmm. So there's this disconnection, which again, the people pleasing, remember if I'm grabbing out there, I have disconnected from my authentic self because I'm looking for it out there. And our moms are such role models for us. In my case, I don't really remember her being loving particularly. I remember her being neutral, a demanding, and then freaking angry. I, I just don't really remember. I mean, my brother remembers having uh, fun with her and, and, and joyous time. I actually don't remember, but that's that's actually an indication of a of a brain that's been traumatized because we have a pretty selective memory and and it can be inaccurate. I really crystallized my memory around certain things that happened that really scared me, and other things I just uh, and the things around that happened just before that. I remember vaguely, but I couldn't tell you the detail, the level that I could about the part that crystallized in my mind. It's just what happens in, in trauma. We get, the memory gets a little distorted. Yeah. So then, okay. So I like that because what you're saying is it's not necessarily the event per se that happens. It's about how you internalize it, how you respond to it. And because most of us in our generation, when we were little, our parents didn't have the awareness, the knowledge, the wisdom that we now have that. Mm -hmm. And even I, as a mom of a 24 and a 21 year old, I still didn't even start to have the knowledge until they were 10 and 13. So they still had all those formative years where I was very unconscious and replaying out generational patterns. So, you know, that there's that piece of it, but so our parents didn't have that. They didn't have that awareness to be able to come in 
and nurture and comfort and say, I'm really sorry. I was just really upset. And I know I just took off in the car and that must have been so scary for you. I can imagine you must have thought like maybe I wasn't coming back. I just needed to go and cool off and I'm really sorry. Whatever, whatever a mom or dad can come in and say to the child to help neutralize the experience so the trauma doesn't form. Mm -hmm. Yes. Any thoughts on that? We get disconnected from our authentic selves, from others in, in this trauma. And so how do we heal? We heal in a safe connection. Mm. So, we're, and what's interesting is our strategy as children is to do whatever we can to try and make that connection with our caretaker, with our other father, whoever's our major caretaker, but our mother tends to be the most important. We're constantly trying to repair, to heal that relationship, to find a safe relationship with her. And that's interesting that we, even though we didn't read that in school or we weren't, we're not conscious of it, it's baked into us. It's for safety, right? It's, and yeah. so you said to me, which was really interesting when we chatted before, let's give perfectionism a different assignment. I loved how you said that. Mm -hmm. And what I thought about with you saying that was, and I know this to be true now, as I'm learning and doing all the work that when I developed the people pleasing and perfectionistic tendencies, that was a strategy for me to protect myself. That was a strategy for me to get my mom to love me, to pay attention to me. Because when I brought home the straight A's, in my case, I did get the affirmation. You have a different story and you can share in a moment when you brought home the straight A's, your mom, it was not enough. It was, you know, why it wasn't good enough for your mom is what you shared with me. Mm -hmm. But even still, even if you didn't get the outcome that you wanted, you still at some level developed, or like you said, the brain and our little child minds knew how to, to find ways to protect ourselves. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if we're in a an energetic field of eggshells as children. You have to be perfect when you're walking. <laughs> That's mean, so true. You're going to crack the eggs otherwise. <laughs> right. So we learn just to keep ourselves safe in that environment to be as perfect mm -hmm. as absolutely possible. And here's what happens because I had to shift it in myself. I had to heal it in myself. Mm -hmm. Here's what happened to me when I would accidentally, when I would like mess up and break an eggshell, I developed a very fierce inner critic, very fierce. And I didn't really understand what was happening years and years later when I was working with a chronic pain specialist who happened to be a psychiatrist and addiction doctor and all kinds of other things. And I'm sitting in his class and I'm sitting with a whole bunch of other chronic pain people in recovery, right? And I said to him, how is it that the inner critic in my head is the scariest person I ever knew in my life, which was the voice of my mother? How did that turn into, how did that end up in my head, right? Here's what happened. Everybody in the room nodded. So I knew I wasn't alone. <laughs> and, so that was number one. And the second thing was, is that Dr. Prescott said, we're wired to attend, to watch out for the uh, biggest threat in our environment. And who is more threatening? The What relationship in our in environment as children is the most delicate and the most, the most important? He said the most threatening. I'm saying the most important because if we screw it up, then we don't survive. That relationship is with our mother or if our father's or if our mother's gone and our father's taking that role or someone else, grandmother, aunt, whoever that is. So then that's why we do whatever we have to do to stay attached to that caregiver. Yes, in any we, way we can. In any way we can. And we cut off from and split off from our true authentic self. That's so right. Yeah, as a that's people pleaser, we might stop speaking up. I learned 
if I spoke up and especially when I entered into my teen years, when developmentally, naturally, I'm supposed to learn to become independent. I'm supposed to, as an adolescent, learn to individuate. And as I was doing those normal, natural developmental behaviors of speaking up, and my mom or any other adult figure, a person of authority didn't like it and they snapped back at me or threatened my quote unquote survival and attachment. Oh, I sure as hell am going to keep my mouth shut now. I'm going to keep my thoughts to myself now because if I speak up, it's like me putting my hand on the stove and getting burned. So there's another trait of the people pleaser is to have the fear of speaking up and speaking out. Any absolutely. thoughts on that? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yes. And, and what's interesting is here are you and I who both had that trait are, are coming out in public and talking about it in a podcast, which is completely opposite of that programming. A hundred percent. Completely opposite. So it gives everybody a, an idea of A, you can heal and B, the the range. We can be, I just want to disappear into the wall to, wow, this can really help heal somebody. So it tells you the trajectory we can go on when we go through trauma and we have that post-traumatic growth space. Um in my case, I would be corrected a lot. And so whatever I had to say was never good enough or it wasn't accurate or it wasn't whatever. It wasn't, and or you asked too many questions or <laughs> whatever it was. And I, so I just stopped, I really just stopped talking. And it was so interesting because when I got into the rooms of recovery, we sit in meetings and we're allowed to share and we're allowed to share for about three minutes, whatever's coming up for us in the meeting and nobody's allowed to give feedback. <laughs> I, I was going to say no cross no talk, but there's support afterwards. Thank you for your share. So that's interesting to me. And I will tell you that when I got in those rooms and first of all, it was, is this really happening? <laughs> Just like, is this really safe? It was that was happening? Yes. I actually that space was very therapeutic for me because I got to practice, and I got to practice hearing my voice and try it out. And oh, what does it sound like? I feel when I share this, and would it be safe to share this? <laughs> and so I'm. We're constantly learning. For me, anyway, I was learning. I was learning about a different kind of boundary. And I was learning about how to do it respectfully, understanding that everybody else in the room is going through their stuff kind of thing. And the thing about the voice is huge. And it can be, it's part of reconnecting to our authentic self is finding our voice again. Yeah. 100%. And I want to say yes to how amazing and incredible it is that you pointed out that you and I are doing this podcast and we are using our voice when that was so incredibly difficult and challenging at one point in your life and my life. And secondly, I didn't even really think we would be talking about 12-step rooms, but I do think that it does lend for the opportunity to really bring it up for someone who might be listening, has never been in a 12 step room, has never heard about recovery, isn't quite ready for a coach or a therapist or whatever. It's a really good starting place because what you just named and I experienced myself in the rooms is how incredibly valuable having that opportunity to share not have somebody to cut you off in the middle and say to you, how dare you say that? What is wrong with you for thinking that way? When in actuality, the opposite is true. When you speak from the heart and you share vulnerably, whatever's going on for you, people in the circle nodding their heads, some might even cry. And you know that when they're nodding their heads, they're hearing you. They're seeing you. And for some people, that is the first time 
in a person's life that they feel seen and heard and, and understood. They, they feel seen, heard, understood, and they realize they're not alone because other people yeah. are nodding in agreement. <laughs> so it's it's not yeah. just me, right? It's a very powerful, it's a very powerful space. I was just finishing a 12 part course that I teach on a trauma recovery. And the last mm -hmm. module was last night and we taught post-traumatic growth. And the very end of it was, this is what a supportive community looks like. And these are the shared agreements that you might want to keep in mind that, that support a safe post-traumatic recovery community. And at 12 step rooms are like that. They have shared agreements and yeah, and it's a really great, and there's all kinds of different 12 step rooms. It's whatever your, whatever your area is, you're going to find a 12 step room for it. It's pretty cool. It very much is. So aside from 12 step rooms, that could be one avenue that a person can take to start healing and recovering. What else would you offer as a way for someone who is wanting to just heal the mother wound, the trauma, the people pleasing perfectionism? What could you suggest? I would suggest getting a with a trauma coach mm -hmm. or a trauma th and a trauma therapist. Like I'm not a trauma therapist, but I'm a great coach in the space because you see the trauma therapist and infrequently, relatively speaking, and a trauma coach would be there to help you do the daily work. I help people set up a daily practice, which helps reinforces, reinforce the, whatever it is you're learning in, in, in therapy or in a trauma course, trauma recovery course. Like I teach trauma-informed yoga. And why is that important? Because we, we heal from the bottom up, meaning we have to start with the nervous system, which is that hypervigilant pattern that we talked about walking on the eggshells. That winds us up into a, this habit that the nervous system says, oh, this is the way we do life. And that's not, we, you can't sustain that. <laughs> that's not, that brings on all kinds of chronic stress, disease and so forth. Yoga, trauma-informed yoga helps you unwind that. Meditation helps you unwind that. A supportive community helps you unwind that. A trauma therapist can help you unwind that, right? Safe relationship. Um, we're talking, you and I are talking about anything that promotes safe relationship is healing. Now we teach you how to self-regulate and that's awesome. But remember, we are deeply, profoundly wired for connection, so yes, we want to regulate the nervous system, but we heal in these co-regulating relationships. So remember that we're, we, there's, we're in a collective and we're experiencing those energies and we need to find safety within our community to help us heal. It, it, when we're, you and I are having, our nervous systems are having a conversation right now as we're having this mental conversation. The nervous systems are having a conversation and because we're in a safe space together and we know we understand that it's understood we're healing because we're in safe relationship. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. So this has been such a profound conversation. We talked about the mother wound, what it looks like. We talked about trauma. We talked about, you just said, self-regulation and community and gave so many pointers. If someone was looking to reach out to you or find you, where can they find you? Oh, thank you. Uh, they can find me at my website, which is Elizabeth with a dash kip.com. Elizabeth hyphen kip.com. You got to put the little dash in there uh, to find me and um, all my social media is there. You can find me all over social media as well. I have lots of free resources up on the website you can book a session with me. I do free introductory sessions. I'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Thank you so much for being a guest today. I really enjoyed this conversation. Oh, so did I. This was great. It's always exciting for me to find someone else in this space that's that's done, done the healing and, and really understands how deep an impression these events that we have when we're younger really have on us and that it's possible to heal them. That's the thing. We are 
for sure sharing our experience, strength, and hope. (laughs) And I say that for those who are listening and not viewing because this podcast is on YouTube and on audio platforms. The reason I shared that is because that is one of the steps that is one of the slogans in a 12 step room is to share and pay forward your experience, strength, and hope. And that is what Elizabeth and I just did with you today. So thank you so much, everyone, for tuning into this episode of Masks Off for people pleasers and perfectionists. And if you enjoyed this content, I would love for a review comment or, and until next week.